Joining us from Geneva is Professor Niles Meltzer. Niles is a human rights, uh, he holds the human rights chair at the Geneva Academy. He's a professor of international law at Glasgow University. And of course, he's the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Torture. And we thank you for joining us, Niles. Thank you for having me. I just want to, as a precursor, ask uh, you to explain to the audience something I think is not widely understood, which is what is the role of a special rapporteur? There's about 37 of them. And uh, I've covered UN headquarters for 25 years. I interacted with n numerous rapporteurs. My understanding is that you're not paid by the UN, in other words, by the governments, the member states, but uh, paid by your own university for your normal salary, and there might be other sources of income. And that's important, of course, because of the independence of the UN rapporteur. Can you explain just briefly what a rapporteur is, what he does, and, and how he's funded? Yeah, right. Um, yeah, special rapporteurs are independent experts uh, that are uh, appointed by the United Nations Human Rights Council, so by the states, um, uh, for a, a period of three years, which is renewable or extendable to six years. Um, and uh, we're not paid, so it's an honorary uh, appointment. Um, and so obviously we'll have to have a job on the side. Usually we're academics. Um, but the mandate we have is to, you know, in my case now is the, the topic of torture and other forms of ill-treatment. And so I have to report as a rapporteur. I'm reporting back to the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly in New York as to the compliance of the UN member states with the prohibition of torture and ill-treatment. And there's three ways in which I do that. I visit countries, usually two or three countries a year, to examine their prison systems and their laws and their practices. The second thing is I do individual interventions, diplomatic interventions on behalf of individual torture victims whose lawyers or family members or they themselves have come, you know, uh, contacted my office. And the third thing is that I, I report, I submit thematic reports on topics like migration or corruption and how it relates to torture. Now, the, the public generally likes to talk about the UN as a monolithic body, but of course it's made up of many, many agencies and with the Secretary of the General Assembly, Security Council, Economic and Social Council, etc. When uh, you make a report, is it correct for people to say the UN has said, has said this? Uh, not really. I, I think it's, it's, it's correct to say that it's the rapporteur that said that, who's an independent expert. So it's not binding for the UN, what I say. Um, uh, obviously, the mandate that I have received by the UN and by its member state is, is important. It gives me a certain you know, level of, of, of authority, but it is an, an expert authority and not the United Nations as a full institution. Right. Now, you, you must know of or know personally Richard Falk. Is that correct? Uh, actually, I don't. <laughs> Richard Falk was, of course, the special rapporteur on Palestine. And uh, well, as you can imagine, the, he was very critical of the state of Israel uh, and very much advocating for the Palestinians and, and incensed the United States and Israel, obviously. And they worked very hard to get his head. I recall standing at the stakeout in front of the Security Council when Susan Rice, who was the U.S. ambassador, at the time uh, openly called for his resignation. Uh, it was because he made a mistake, really. He gave him an opening by writing something about 9-11 on his blog that he, he questioned the official narrative of it. And that was enough. They looked for something to get him. And Ban Ki-moon, uh, you know, uh, put out a statement under pressure from the U.S. very easily. Uh, he said that this was uh, unacceptable, but he, that it was up to the Human Rights Council to uh, dispense with him. They did not. He left. He wasn't reappointed. So my question to you is, after what you've said about Julian Assange, and given the political and media climate that we are in about him after his indictment by the U.S. government under the Espionage Act, have you been pressured by any governments at all? On no, not, not, so, not so far, not so far. Um, obviously, uh, uh, you know, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but uh, uh, I have been very outspoken so far. Uh, I have not received any, you know, uh, pushback uh, apart from simply the you know, the answer of uh, the Foreign Secretary of the UK on Twitter, uh, basically stating that I should not uh, interfere with the UK judicial system, which was a bit surprising given that Mr. Hunt is my counterpart in the UK and actually invited me to, you know, upon my request, invited me to visit Mr. Assange and obviously also knew that, uh, you know, uh, what my mandate was and that I might come up with some statements that might criticize uh, the UK. Well, speaking of uh, visiting Julian Assange, do you plan to see him 
Again, are you trying, because we know very little about his condition right now. It's gone dark after it was decided that the extradition hearing would begin next February. Um, so are you planning to see him again? Uh, I, no, I don't. It's actually an exception that I can go and visit individual uh, uh, prisoners because obviously I'm, I'm mandated to cover 190 you know, plus uh, UN member states and all the uh, victims of torture uh, or potential victims of torture in these countries. So there is no way I could follow up on an individual uh, you know, regularly and go and visit them in prison. Um, I felt that this case is very important because it's so politicized. Um, I felt that I cannot make a, a objective assessment without actually going and visiting him in prison. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Yes, um, following up on, on Joe's question earlier, I was wondering, uh, now that you've published your report, what if any further steps can be taken um, to act on your findings? Is there any place that this case goes um, um, within the UN? Is there any other steps that can be taken by the public that you would like to talk about? Or is this kind of um, the end of the road as far as uh, what can be done from your end on this case? No, no I think, uh, I. I, my action really was to go and visit him, and then based on this visit, I drew my conclusions. We did this medical assessment, I did my legal assessment, and I communicated my concerns and my recommendations to uh, the four involved states, the US, the UK, Sweden, and, and Ecuador. Now, uh, these letters that I sent in the end of May, they will be published in the end of July, 60 days after they have been written. That's the standard procedure. And that's also the, the deadline for those states to actually respond in writing to the questions and the recommendations I make. Um, now, if I feel that these responses warrant you know, further action on my part, I can do that. I can write back to them and say, well, thank you for your answer, or, you know, or I, I deplore that I didn't get an answer, and I would like to ask you know, the, these follow-up questions so I can, I can take this dialogue further. And all of these, uh, this correspondence will obviously also be published uh, with my next report to the Human Rights Council. And each individual communication will be published 60 days after it has been made. Interesting. Thank you. Um, what what do you think it says that some uh, human rights advocates have sort of doubled down on this um, rape narrative that you so so much criticized in your report and afterwards? Um, do you think that it's a, a situation where there are a large number of people who perhaps are uninformed about the facts and have not given it a real um, solid um, you know amount of their time to actually research what happened underneath what you I believe you called a superficial narrative? Um, you know, or is this sort of um, exactly what you were talking about in your report? Is it basically, uh, you know, the stenographers of the state doubling down on, on a favored lie? Uh, what, what's your perception on that? Well, I, I think the general public is misinformed. Uh, now, I don't think they're to blame because, you know, there's so much it's not expected of every citizen of this world to actually research the facts in every single case that is being addressed or even not addressed by the press. Um, and I myself, as I have said publicly before, I, I have been misinformed about the case of Julian Assange because I had never dealt with it before, I've never met the man before. And only when I started looking into this case, I started realizing how much fabrication there was. Now, I don't think that this misinformation is a coincidence. Um, I do th think that there's too many factors where we see that the involved states have, act have actually actively pushed a narrative that is a clear uh, a contradiction with the facts. Uh, but then that the public takes this up, and I think I, one of my roles as a rapporteur is to report to the UN and to the states, but also to the public and make them aware and encourage them to live, you know, to basically look behind the surface or below the surface a little bit themselves. Because I can say that the information, the reality, the truth is very close, immediately under the surface. You don't have to dig very deep. Now, you um, expressed in an earlier interview, you knows the fear that Assange could actually die in prison. Um, there was a video that was released, the video of, of Assange in prison. The video took, was taken before he became seriously ill and was taken to hospital. Uh, but it was released after he 
went into the hospital, creating a false impression that some media outlets uh, fostered that he was okay. Uh, he was actually in hospital at the time the video came out, and it looked, he looked to even be smiling and standing around. Uh, did you see that video, and what did you think about that? Yeah, I've seen the video, and it, it does show the cell that I visited, where he was, the cell uh, number 37, where he was actually being detained. Um, and it, it, it shows, if I remember well, it shows that some inmates help him prepare the room for being painted. When I was visiting, it had just been painted. So that was before my visit that this video had been taken. Um, when I visited him, um, I was able to have conversations with him. He, he was agitated and he showed the symptoms that I described publicly. Of, of someone who had been exposed to psychological torture for a prolonged period of time. And also, the, but I was able to converse with him. And, and I also think it's very important that we get a realistic picture. Someone who has been tortured does not necessarily sit in a corner the whole day and, you know, just kind of shiver. And torture victims, especially psychological torture, is very perfidious. It, it, it aims at destroying your, your, your innermost self, uh, your self-confidence, your sense of reality, uh, and, and, and your emotional kind of and, and mental stability. But that does not mean you don't necessarily see that from the outside. That's why I took two experienced medical experts with me um, who, who were able to you know, have worked with torture victims for, for decades, one a psychiatrist and the other one a forensic expert. And they're able to look at people and to run tests on them and medical protocols that are designed for that purpose. And they can distinguish symptoms that come from torture and ill-treatment from other symptoms because any prisoner is sometimes depressed because he's in prison. You know, Anyone who's facing criminal prosecution uh, has a certain amount of anxiety. That's not necessarily torture. Uh, so it's important to know that, you know, you don't necessarily see torture written on the face of a torture victim, just as you don't see child abuse written on, on a child's face in school, just as you don't see necessarily, you know, battered wife written on the face of a battered wife. You know, uh, Assange was a one of the most wanted men by the British and American establishments for what he has revealed, particularly about the U.S., which are prima facie evidence of war crimes in Iraq and other corruption and many other governments. So now they've got him. They have him in prison, finally. Uh, do you have any indication at all, any evidence or from him or any other source that he's already being interrogated or questioned without a lawyer being present? Uh, and if so, are you worried that uh, at one point they may not. They may be finished with him in terms of what they can get out of him, his sources or whatever else they want to get from him, and that they wouldn't care one way or the other about his help. Well, no, I have not. I have no indications that he's already being questioned. Uh, what I do know is that he's not being given sufficient access to his lawyers and sufficient access to legal documents to prepare a defense uh, in, in his various proceedings against him. Uh, not in the Swedish proceedings, which for now don't ask for an extradition anymore, but are still prosecuting, are still investigating rape allegations against him. He did not get sufficient time with his lawyer to discuss these allegations. The lawyer went to see him in prison. He had a two-hour slot reserved for this visit. And Assange was brought to this meeting with one hour and 45 minutes delay. He only had 20 minutes to translate a 400-page Swedish language court document to Assange, uh, which obviously is not sufficient, and he was not allowed to have these documents in English or in any language that he understands. So how should he prepare his defense? The same thing, you saw that he then participated in one of the extradition hearings uh, uh, a few weeks uh, through video link, and he was basically confronted with an outline or a summary of the, the, uh, the U.S. indictment, and he was asked to, to take position, but he had not received the actual indictment and been able to read through it and actually understand what he's being charged of. So there, this is, you know, really looks like a serious violation of his procedural rights. Elizabeth. 
absolutely. That's extremely concerning. And I don't think that's really been talked about uh, much in the media whatsoever. And neither has most most of your, you know, your report would receive some attention. But after that, um, it seems that, uh, you know, mainstream corporate media was very uninterested in what you had to say. Um, I don't know if you have any comment on that or, or your perception of, of the mainstream media now versus before um, taking up this case. Yes, I, unfortunately, I, I would say, you know, if someone in my position, if you look back at the 20 years of my career, I've not been known to spread conspiracy theories. I've not been known to, you know, be headline hunting at all. I have a background with the ICRC, confidentiality, 12 years. I've worked for the Swiss government, foreign affairs. Um, um, you know, it's, I've had positions that required a very moderate and balanced and objective approach. This is the first case where I actually come out in my life, uh, where, and as I said in my press release, this is the first time in 20 years that I see democratic states ganging up and isolating a single individual and, and systematically violating his fair trial guarantees, his human rights in, in every aspect, and you know, arbitrary detention and even ill-treatment mobbing that amounts to psychological torture cumulatively. Um, that's very serious. And what surprises me is that beyond, you know, it's not a matter whether you like or don't like Assange. This is really not even about Assange. It's about these states and what they're doing. And how is it possible that the populations of the U.S., of the UK, of Sweden, and of Ecuador tolerate this type of mistreatment and misuse of judicial powers uh, against a, a single individual. Um, so to me, this is inherently newsworthy. It's something where the mainstream press, the so-called fourth power in the state, should jump on it and investigate it. And by all means, you know, if, if I'm not right, let's expose it. But they should engage with me and test, you know, these these allegations that I make, these conclusions I draw uh, very thoroughly. Because if I am right, this is extremely serious, not only for Assange. That is what I found so extraordinary about your report, at least the public report, when you use that term "ganging up," in re reference to democratic states. Now, just, we talk about American exceptionalism, but I think it extends over to, to the UK as well. There is a sense that they are above international law, that it's for everyone else, but not for them. And that the ICC, for example, the International Criminal Court, should never investigate uh, what anything that a Western white leader does. Uh, and there's been a huge problem, in, the, in my view, in the credibility of the ICC, but it extends here to this case as well. And you had the guts, uh, frankly, to say that to take them on like that. And I think that's why I asked you my earlier question, whether you've gotten any uh, backlash from the governments, and uh, you say they have it. I uh, I think I point to your Newsweek piece again because it was extraordinary. You quote extensively from the U.S. Declaration of Independence that when when a people no longer satisfied with their government it was their duty, basically, to rise up against it. And uh, the way I look at it now, we've reached a, a point like in the U.S. The American people are living in a bubble, not only separated by two oceans, but by a whole a faulty view of themselves and where America's role in the world is. Now this is promulgated by government through media. So a guy like Assange could be seen as being uh, against the interests of the United States when he is not against the interests of the American people whatsoever, but of the rulers of the United States. Um, I, I wonder what uh, you uh, think of uh, Leona Brinkema. She is the judge that he will most likely face if he's extradited to the U.S. She's known as the national security judge. She's in a courtroom just uh, about a five-minute drive from where I am in Alexandria, Virginia. I've been in her courtroom. You have said before, but I want to ask you again, does he stand any chance of getting anywhere near a fair trial, given the, also the, uh, the state secrets uh, privilege that the U.S. has, in which uh, evidence could be withheld from uh, the court? Does he have any chance of a fair trial in the U.S.? Not, not in my view. Not in my view. Not at all. I, I, I think that you know, the public prejudice against Assange is, is monumental in the United States. He's being perceived as one of, you know, public enemies number one. Um, he is being, I mean, obviously described as 
as uh, you know as a public enemy basically by the the, the current uh, secretary of state and former CIA director um, um, obviously other public figures have called for his assassination I mean there are whole videos on YouTube summarizing this uh, that last you know minutes and minutes um, uh, you, you have these this so you, you have this environment, and then you, you, you send them to a court where, to my knowledge, no national security defendant has ever been acquitted. Um, you, you send them to a court, I think it's the same court and the same judge, if I'm not mistaken, that has also uh, uh, been responsible for the trial against uh, Chelsea Manning, um, where you know she has been sentenced to 35 years originally, um, which is a draconian uh, punishment. I agree that, well, you know, whistleblowing can be an offense uh, under national law, especially if you have been entrusted with this information. But then where are the prosecutions of these, as you say, prima facie war crimes? Where are the investigations and prosecutions of all the other crimes and, and corrupt activities that have been exposed by, by this whistleblower and by WikiLeaks? Um, because when you, as I've said before, when you prosecute a whistleblower and a journalist for exposing war crimes and corruption, uh, you have to be very careful because if you don't prosecute the war crimes, then clearly you don't have equality before the law. You clearly, there's no chance of having a fair trial. Clearly then prosecution becomes persecution. Absolutely. And following on from that, um, what do you think, um, in a worst case scenario where Assange is, you know, convicted in the United States, we know that would have dire consequences for journalism, but what, can you comment on the consequences that would have for human rights, not only in Assange's case specifically and for whistleblowers and publishers of whistleblower uh, leaked material, but also in general in terms of silencing someone who, as you just said, has exposed these human rights abuses and, war, yeah. and evidence of war crimes? Well, you know, I, I wonder, you know, could I be prosecuted uh, for for putting out information that I have observed about torture and ill-treatment just because they're in the public or the, the national interest of a state? Um, you know, I, I, I think this is a is an absolutely emblematic case. It is really a, 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 a precedent of an importance that cannot be overstated. We have extremely powerful institutions today with states. Um, the division of power between the judiciary, the government, and the parliament very frequently doesn't work that well because people know each other, they help each other, they cover each other. They're all human beings, right? Uh, and, and so that's why the media, as the fourth power, is absolutely essential that they actually hold power, to, uh, governmental power to account. The judiciary also has to do that. If that no longer functions, if and, and now we even start criminalizing exposure of, of abuse and crime and corruption, well, what this means is basically we're enforcing a system of impunity. And we know from neuroscience that unchecked power, once you have unchecked power it could any human being if you don't if you don't if you're not subject to some form of effective control um, you know pe people lose control in how they abuse power that's not because someone is a bad person it's just because human beings are like that that's neuroscience right so I, I think it's extremely important that we maintain an effective system of oversight and journalism is absolutely crucial to that Perhaps it's not overstating it, but uh, it won't be just Assange that could be put on trial, but the idea of a democracy itself, because this is uh, a case that is, without exaggeration, a historic, and, and in the sense that no journalist ever in the United States has been prosecuted for publishing classified information, or, uh, and that is extremely worrying, obviously. But I wonder if you think that the U where the U.S. stands in terms of its democracy right now, and if he's put away for, for years, what would that mean about whether the U.S. is still a democracy? Well, democracy means it's the rule of the people. If the people tolerate it consciously, then it's perhaps still a democracy. I don't know. Uh, but it's one that would allow uh, impunity for massive abuse. 
uh, impunity for war crimes, impunity for corruption. And I don't think that anyone in the US really wants that. A normal UN citizen wouldn't want that. I don't think it's for me to you know, make an assessment of the state of American democracy, but I, I think I can see what are the risks uh, arising from this case for uh, uh, American rule of law and American democracy. I have voiced that in, 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 in various uh, publications. And uh, obviously, when I call on people to stand up and take responsibility, I don't mean that in terms of violence or uprising. What I mean is that they use their democratic rights that they have to hold those accountable that govern them their representatives in Congress, they, you know, they're the ones that elect the president. That's the people. They have to take responsibility and make sure that government is held accountable, that they talk to the press, that they demand from the press to be informed, uh, you know, and, and empowered uh, and not just entertained. Well, thank you, Nils Meltzer, very, very much. We've been joined from Geneva by Nils Meltzer. He's the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, and we've been speaking about his report about WikiLeaks publisher, Julian Assange. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much for having me.